Welcome to the Stryker Surgical Technology Mobile Experience. This 96 foot long semi truck has been converted into a showroom and teaching environment. We are able to travel the country and bring education to the doorstep of our healthcare professionals and partner with them in their goal to zero harm in the operating room. Our mobile experience will pull up looking like a regular semi truck and then will expand to be triple wide, giving us plenty of space to host a variety of events. The mobile experience is powered by Shore Power or our generator and is fully equipped with an HVAC, electricity, Wi-Fi, and water. Once inside, you no longer feel like you're in the trailer of a semi truck. At Surgical Technologies, our solutions are safeguarding and empowering our healthcare professionals so they can create a safe environment for their teams and their patients. We are able to demonstrate on the mobile lab the use of our products and healthcare professionals can get a hands-on experience right here on site. Come inside and take a look. Hello and welcome to the AORN Virtual Guidelines Workshop live from the Stryker Mobile Experience here in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. Titled Surgical Smoke and RSI's Guidelines and Technology to Support Zero Harm. My name is Jake Runyon with AORN and I will be your moderator for today's event. First, I would like to thank our audience for joining us today and taking time out of your busy OR schedules. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to point out some of the features in the webinar environment. If you hover your cursor over the bottom portion of your screen, a toolbar will appear. To ask our presenter any question, please click on the Q&A icon and type your question into the pop-up box. Please feel free to type these questions in at any time, but note that we will hold questions until the end of each individual presentation. We will have a five minute question and answer session following those presentations and a brief Q&A after our demos. If you are having technical difficulties, however, please use that same Q&A icon and those questions will be answered in real time. AORN is the continuing education provider for this virtual event. Attendees will receive 1.5 contact hours of continuing education credit for nurses. Funding for this webinar was generously provided by Stryker. Now onto our agenda for the day. We will hear presentations from two of our guideline authors at AORN from perioperative practice around RSI and surgical smoke safety. We will also have two demonstrations of technologies designed to support these guidelines following our guideline author presentations. We will end our time together with a robust panel discussion with perioperative leaders along with our two guideline authors to learn strategies on how to implement these very important changes in your facility. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Dr. Julie Kahn. Starting in 2003, Dr. Kahn has worked in eight operating rooms across the United States, all the way from Boston to Hawaii, giving her that well-rounded perspective of her clinical practice. She completed an MSN in, it, as a clinical nurse specialist in 2007 and a doctorate in nursing practice in 2017. Much of her work has re revolved around professional development of perioperative nurses and ensuring excellence in patient outcomes. Dr. Khan has worked in a as a perioperative well, practice specialist with ARN well, since 2017 well, you know, like and is currently you know. revising the guideline for medication safety for shock. publication next year. Yeah, that's what Justin told me. At this point, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Julie. Great. Thank you so much, Jake. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here in Phoenix. It's um, my pleasure to have you on this presentation today on preventing retained surgical items. My purpose here today is threefold. First, I'm going to review the impact and incidence of RSIs. And then I'm going to review selected updates from the guideline. Lastly, I'm going to discuss a new and upcoming program sponsored by Stryker through the ARN Foundation. This guideline has been around in some form for 45 years. When it's published in 2022, um, in December here, it will be the seventh revision of this document. The title of this guideline was updated to the Guideline for Prevention of Unintentionally Retained Surgical Items. 
Now, the reason for this change was to clarify that items are not retained intentionally and to create alignment with how other organizations refer to this topic. Now, you may be wondering about things that are intentionally left in the patient, such as therapeutic packing after the wound is closed. It, when that happens, that is an unintentionally retained surgical item. There might also be other items, such as biliary stents or urinary stents, where implement, implantation excuse me, of that item was intended only for a short period of time, such as 30 days or six months. Items that were retained in the patient after they're intended to be removed would also be unintentional. Now I wanna start by discussing some of the changes that were made to how this guideline is organized. On the screen, the figure on the left is from the current 2021 edition, and the figure on the right is the table of contents from the 2022 revised edition. Let's start at the top. The first section has been split into two sections. The first section still contains all the content on teamwork and personnel in specific roles, like the circulating nurse or the anesthesia professional and how they can prevent RSIs. In the current edition, that section is very large and it had this natural breaking point right where we started to discuss how to count or how to manage count processes. We decided to move that content into its own section named standardized procedure. Next, you'll see on the right that under section six, we adjusted the title to include X plans. We added this because there is a recommendation in that section specific to removal of implants. Next is a new section on preventing retained foam pieces from dressings used with negative pressure wound therapy devices. And last, you'll see that there is a new section on education. While rare, the true incidence of RSIs is unknown. Rates of RSIs vary widely depending on the source, and it is believed that RSIs are underreported and underestimated, which is concerning since they are the most commonly reported um, sentinel event to the Joint Commission. Most people quote Dr. Atul Gawande, who estimated in 2003, based on 1999 data, that 1,500 RSIs occur annually in the United States. A 2020 study, more recently here, by Dr. Gunner et al. on RSIs at the Veterans Health Administration Surgical Programs reported in their study an incidence rate of 1 in 23,908 procedures. Important to our discussion today is that most of the reported RSIs are surgical sponges. And while sponges have been reported as retained behind the eye, the ear, and the nasal cavity, most, and during less invasive procedures, most RSIs are in fact retained in the abdomen, pelvis, and vagina. The body, patient's body can react severely to a retained sponge. There are known risk factors and contributing factors for RSIs. Risk factors include patient and procedural characteristics like incorrect counts, long procedures, or more than one procedure. And most contributing factors boil down to human factors, such as distractions or fatigue, leadership, including failure to follow policy and procedure, and communication breakdown. Harm can include infection, abscess, adhesions, fistulas, perforations, reoperations, and sadly, death, to name a few. There is also emotional harm to patients and their families that is hard to quantify. And last but not least, there is cost. Um, there is state penalties, litigation and settlement fees, reoperation, and length of stay fees, to name a few. Additionally, the perioperative team members could, in these events, also experience a phenomenon known as second victim, where they may feel disbelief, anxiety, or fear about the event or potential future events. And because of the harm of RSIs, they can be associated with those substantial costs that I outlined. Reporting these events can vary between facilities, but the reports of the event are generally made internally to the accreditation body, to the manufacturer, and to the state 
and FDA. The 2022 guideline for prevention of unintentionally retained surgical items is just chock full of recommendations to help you prevent and reduce the risk of RSIs. Now, we don't have time today to cover all of these solutions, so we're going to focus on technology. However, before we do, it is important to understand the implementation of any technology without a consistent interdisciplinary process, standardized procedures, and a robust understanding of the risk of RSIs at your facility may not be as effective. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the updated and new recommendations in the section on adjunct technology that pertain to retained soft goods. This section has about three significantly changed recommendations and seven new recommendations. First, we still recommend that you evaluate adjunct technology devices, but this year we did include what should be evaluated. The next biggest change made in this section is, is that instead of only evaluating adjunct technology, we now recommend that your facility implement an adjunct technology device to detect the location and verify the, lo the outcome or of manual accounting procedures for surgical soft goods when possible. However, we conditionally recommend that you, it is clarified in the policy and procedure for your facility when adjunct technology may be waived. This may be specific instances or procedures when the device is exempt from use. And lastly is a series of recommendations to support and clarify the implementation of adjunct technology use, such as following the instructions for use, implementing the system throughout the facility at the same time, using the selected system even when the count is thought to be correct, cleaning and disinfecting the system after use, providing education and competency verification for personnel who use the system. Now let's return to that new big change in these recommendations because this was a large shift from our current recommendation. Our current guidance is, is that facilities may evaluate adjunct technology devices to use to supplement the manual accounting procedures, which changed to a recommendation that your facility should implement adjunct technology. Now the evidence is clear. While manual accounting is important, it is susceptible to human error, and it is unlikely to improve to higher levels of accuracy as it stands right now. Retained soft goods continue to occur despite manual accounting processes and the use of radiography during count discrepancies. In instances of RSI, the count has been reported as correct between 62 to 88% of the time, meaning that a retained, there is a retained item most of the time when the count is thought to be correct. Therefore, adjunct technology is needed to help improve the accuracy of manual accounting procedures for surgical soft goods by verifying the outcome or to help locate the misplaced soft goods. Adjunct technology is available for many of the soft goods used in surgery today, and it may help prevent retained sponges. Also in section nine is a series of recommendations intending to keep patients safe while using adjunct technology devices, specifically those that use radio frequency or radio frequency identification. The devices that use RF or RFID technology have the potential to cause electromagnetic interference, also known as EMI, in other electronic devices also being used with that patient. Now, there are a few reported instances of temporary pacemaker inhibition when it stopped working, when adjunct technology devices that use radio frequency have been used. A study on the electromagnetic compatibility of passive RFID readers suggested that EMI may vary depending on the frequencies used and that the lower the frequency, the more likely the risk for interference. Therefore, it is important to notify the team before using adjunct technology devices that use RF or RFID. This may allow the team and especially the anesthesia provider to prepare for the device being used. EMI reports on EMI on RF adjunct technology devices suggest that EMI may be avoided if temporary pacemakers are set to asynchronous mode before using the device. 
that is the adjunct technology device. Setting the temporary pacemaker to a synchronous mode, however, may not be optimal in all um, uh, patient situations. And therefore, the, the researchers did suggest that providers weigh the risks and benefits of pacemaker inhibition individually. Because of the potential for inhibition of temporary pacemakers, it's also recommended not to use the pacemaker or implant or uh, not to program, excuse me, the pacemaker, a pacemaker or an implantable uh, cardioverter defibrillator, otherwise known as ICD, when um, using adjunct technology devices that use these settings. All right. A methodical wound exploration has been recommended for many years, including the use of a camera for a methodical wound exploration during MIS or minimally invasive procedures. This year, we also added a recommendation on methodical wound exploration of the vagina when it is entered during operative or other invasive procedures such as vaginal deliveries. In a study of 319 retained surgical sponges reported to the Joint Commission between 2012 and 2017, 23.9, that is almost 24% of those retained soft goods were retained in the vagina. And of those 24%, 82.2 of those were retained after vaginal delivery. The researchers in that study did recommend a vaginal sweep. We have also recommended the use of pocketed sponge holders for many years, but this year we did add language that the background color should provide contrast. Using a pocketed sponge holder system that has a clear background can affect the ability of personnel to distinguish the number of sponges in each device when there's multiple layers of filled pocketed sponge holders hanging on one the same stand. Using pocketed sponge holder systems with a contrasting background may provide improved visibil visibility of those sponges in the device. Sponges could appear white or red depending on whether they have been used. We also added recommendations, we also have recommendations on following the manufacturer's instructions for use, placing the sponges in the holder with care to prevent unintended separation of the horizontal pocket perforations and discarding the holder and using a new holder when the pocket perforations do become separated unintentionally. The anticipated e-release date for this guideline is Thursday, December 9th. This is when the guideline will be published on eGuidelines Plus for those facilities and individuals that have a paid subscription. The guideline is also scheduled for publication in the 2022 print edition of the Guidelines for Perioperative Practice book, which is usually available in January of each year. Now soon, we'll be unveiling a new Center of Excellence program to help prevent RSIs. This program is evidence-based and it will include scenario-based immersive technology, short online modules, pre and post tests, gap analysis tools, and audits to confirm progress, and if I'm not giving away the farm, an escape room. You can sign up to be notified when the program becomes available through the QR code link here on the screen or the website. This program is sponsored by, AOR, by, excuse me, by Stryker through the AORN Foundation. Here are the references for this presentation. And I just want to end by saying thank you for all you do for perioperative patients in our profession. If you want to hear more on this topic, I'll be speaking on all the guideline updates during a recorded webinar here shortly in November and at the 2022 AORN Global Surgical Conference and Expo in New Orleans in March. Registration for the Expo will open shortly. Have a great day. And now I'll take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Julie. At this time, I would like to invite our audience to ask any questions that you may have for Julie, uh, as we really do want to hear from you. Please be sure to use that Q&A icon at the bottom, and I will read them for Julie. Julie, first question is, as you've sifted through all of this research uh, for your guideline revisions related to RSI, what would you say is your biggest aha moment? Oh, that's great. Thanks for that question. Um, 
I would say one of the biggest aha moments I had in the guideline revision process was related to the amount of sponges that are retained in the, the vagina and vaginal cavity area. Um, sadly, there is quite a lot of sponges in that area retained, and that points to the need for um, implementation of the tech of adjunct technology and uh, robust counting processes with the team in all areas of the facility including labor and delivery but also not to forget other areas um, such as cath lab and EP lab and all those kind of spaces so um, don't just use it in your OR use use adjunct technology in many places and that will help reduce the ret rate of retained sponges at least in the vagina and also in other areas Thank you, Julie. You, you hit on the topic of human error. And I know as we've discussed, um, it's, it's, it's just always going to be there. In your research, did you, did you see any specific data um, or statistics around the possibility of human error? Oh, yeah. That's another great question. Thanks, Jake and audience here. Human manual counting continues to be important, and we continue to recommend it. It is the one of the primary methods of helping to prevent retained surgical items. But what the literature does show is is that it is fallible, and it right now it's unlikely to improve to higher levels of accuracy. That the rate of retained items overall, the, when a count is correct, is between and I know I stated it earlier, 62 to 88 percent. So. Anything that we can do to help us assist us in, in getting better at knowing whether there is or is not something retained is really important. And, and that is part of that annual counting um, accuracy. Hope that answers that question. No, very well stated. Thank you, Julie. We have time for one last question, uh, Julie. And the question is, is there a recommendation for the pocket holder placement in regards to the surgical field? Um, just to clarify, like how far it can be from the surgical field? Yes. Um, no, there's not a recommendation on that pers on the length, the the distance between the two. Um, but what I would say is is that it should be visible to the surgical field, especially the ho the whole area, um, top to bottom, so they can see if there's missing sponges in any of the pockets. Um, but again, you want to protect the sterile field from possible contamination. So far enough away to be visible and useful, but not too close to cause um, a potential for contamination. That's, that's what no one has done a study on that. So I encourage you to get out there and, and check on that if you have further questions. Thank you, That's Julie. It. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish you a beautiful day. Thank you again, Julie, for that informative presentation. Very well done. At this time, I would like to invite Mackenzie Lapp from the Stryker team to demonstrate technology aimed at reducing the incidence of retained sponges in surgery. Mackenzie? Thank you. My name is Mackenzie Lapp and I am a marketing associate with Stryker Surgical Technologies. I'm here today to talk to you about our journey to zero harm, specifically our journey to zero retained surgical sponges. Here to help with that is Surge Account Plus, our sponge counting system. I'm gonna give you a quick product demo of it, but before I get into that, just a reminder, we will be taking questions during this time. So go ahead, type your questions in the chat and we'll answer in real time or else circle back around to them at the end. So our Surge Account Plus system comes with three main components. The first being the hardware. So this hardware can be used in any procedural room where you are counting sponges. Next, we have the surgical sponges themselves. So these sponges are uniquely identified utilizing an RFID tag. Each sponge comes with a one-of-a-kind alphanumeric code that allows us to identify and track each and every sponge that gets used in a case. Next, we have our universal reporting tool. So this is a back-end database that uploads all of the case information from this tablet and from the case and can be connected to your hospital's EMR. Now, let's get started. First, you're gonna scan your circulator ID. Next, you would scan your patient ID. It can be the wristband, it can be their barcode, 
and now we will select service. It comes with a pre-populated set of options. You just choose the one that fits. Now we'll start the case. It takes you to this count in screen. You're going to take your pack of sponges, wave it in front of the reader, and as you can see, we have five 18 by 18 laps counted in. At the end of the case, you switch over to that count out screen and following your hospital's policies and procedures, you're going to scan out each sponge one by one. As you can see, our pocketed sponge bags come with that contrasting background color that Julie mentioned in her presentation. But now we get to this point where we have five counted in, but only four counted out. There's still one sponge left. So this is when the newest addition to Surge Account Plus comes into play, and that is our reader. We lovingly call her Rita because she is going to be your staff's best friend in finding a missing sponge in the OR. To use Rita, you're going to click Find Sponges, follow the prompts on screen, so remove the reader from the cradle, pull the trigger, and search the area for the missing sponge. When you pull that trigger, it's going to give you a visual and audible cue and sort of like a metal detector, as you get closer to that sponge, the beeping will intensify and it turns green. Because of this RFID technology and RFID tag, Rita knows she's looking for that specific alphanumeric code. Once you find that sponge, you're gonna redock Rita, scan that last sponge out, and it'll take you to this end case case summary. So Rita's gonna save you in a significant amount of time when looking for that missing sponge and also prevent, hopefully, any future cases of dumpster diving. So once you get to this case summary page, you click Next, scan your ID, and then simply click End Case. At this point, all of that case information is being uploaded into that universal reporting tool and then can be connected to your facility's EMR. So Surge Account Plus is here to help us move away from that number one never event and towards that journey to zero retained surgical sponges. Thank you for your time. That concludes the product demo and I will open it up to some questions. Mackenzie, we have time for one question. So we'll go ahead and go with a very popular question, which is, especially for those that have, that have used the Surge Account system in the past, but even new users, can you explain the key differences between the previous Surge Account system and this new Surge Account Plus system? Yes, great question. So key differences is that ability to go and find the missing sponge in the operating room and also the ability to connect to your facility's EMR. Perfect. Thank you, Mackenzie, for that informative demonstration. We will now take a short two-minute break before our next presentation. Welcome back, everybody. Just want to remind everybody that the Q&A function will be live during these, this entire uh, seminar, so please keep the questions coming. If we're unable to get to those live, we will uh, get to those in the virtual environment and try to get you the best answers possible. At this time, I would like to introduce Emily Jones. Emily is an AORM perioperative practice specialist with over 20 years of experience in the perioperative setting. And she is currently a PhD candidate uh, which we are all very proud of. She has authored educational study guides for perioperative nurses and clinical issues, issues columns for the AORN Journal. Most recently, Emily has focused on the revision of the AORN guideline for surgical smoke safety. She has presented on a variety of topics from coordinating successful interprofessional education programs to implementing evidence-based practice strategies. During her perioperative clinical experience, Emily served in roles of staff nurse, mentor, educator, charge nurse, and a manager at a very busy level one trauma center. She has established ex expertise in many subject areas, including team communication, perioperative crisis simulation education, and surgical staff and patient safety. Emily, at this point, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to you. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Jake. I'm thrilled to be here with you today to discuss the updated AORN guideline for surgical smoke safety. So if you, if you have worked in an operating room, 
you'll know what we're talking about when we say that surgical smoke, it's visible and it just smells bad. It's something we're aware of in the operating room and we should, of course, not be breathing it. Um, surgical smoke evacuation applies to all areas where surgery is being performed. It includes ambulatory settings all the way to inpatient procedure and surgical settings. Surgical smoke is the byproduct of using surgical energy devices that apply uh, heat to tissue. And this raises the intracellular temperature uh, to above 100 degrees Celsius. And as we use these surgical energy devices in the operating room, which are critical to patient care, we have to be aware of the importance also of evacuating uh, that surgical smoke. Surgical smoke is also referred to as surgical plume, smoke plume, bioaerosols, laser generated airborne contaminants, uh, but throughout this presentation today and throughout our guideline, we will be referring to it as surgical smoke. Ever since the introduction of the electrosurgical unit in 1926, personnel in the operating room have been exposed to the odors and the hazards of surgical smoke. Research. Uh, the first research uh, that analyzed the contents of surgical smoke was as early as 1976. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, recognizes that many healthcare workers are exposed to the hazards of surgical smoke. In 1988, OSHA issued a hazard information bulletin on surgical smoke, initially acknowledging surgical smoke as an emerging uh, problem, though. Since then, no specific OSHA standards uh, address surgical smoke. In 1989, researchers with NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, evaluated the effectiveness of smoke evacuation for laser surgery. Then, in 1996, NIOSH published a hazard control for surgical smoke. And so, as you can see in this timeline, uh, there have been many organizations, including AORN, AORN and NIOSH, that have recommended surgical smoke evacuation for over 25 years. However, staff members and other members of the operating room continue to um, uh, demonstrate a lack of compliance with surgical smoke safety. So let's get into the updated guideline. The updated guideline has been reorganized to better align with the CDC and NIOSH hierarchy of controls. This emphasizes the importance of considering elimination of the hazard as the first and most reliable strategy to reduce risk. We'll discuss that application in a few moments. The guideline sections are similar to the previous version with only a couple of small changes you'll see that filtration was added to the title of the smoke evacuation section. This term has been added to this section and throughout the guideline where it's appropriate to really highlight the importance of filtration in conjunction with effective smoke evacuation. You'll also notice that respiratory protection has been placed into its own section. Of course, AORN continues to recommend that healthcare organizations provide a surgical smoke-free work environment and that organizations evaluate the perioperative team members' risk of exposure to surgical smoke. This assessment may include job description or tasks that place a team member at risk, types of procedures where surgical smoke is generated, types of tissue involved in surgical smoke production, length of time surgical smoke is being produced, and the availability and use of surgical smoke management systems. Now here's that CDC NIOSH hierarchy of controls, controlling exposures to the hazards um, of surgical smoke is fundamental to protecting workers. This hierarchy of controls has been applied to, this, to surgical smoke safety as a means of determining how to implement feasible and effective controls. 
you can see at the top, uh, the most effective method is through elimination and substitution. Um, though we recognize that this is not always feasible. So moving down this hierarchy, engineering controls include uh, physical changes to the work environment that will minimize the healthcare worker's exposure to the hazard. Engineering controls include surgical smoke evacuation and filtration, uh, and working in operating rooms with a minimum of 20 air exchanges per hour, though we don't rely on that. Uh, administrative controls continuing down in that hierarchy are used in conjunction with the other controls that more directly reduce exposure to the hazard. And then the last line of defense is personal protective equipment, and in this case, respiratory protection. A new recommendation supports collaboration with the perioperative team to determine a plan for surgical smoke safety before the procedure and then to reassess, as the, reassess your plan as the needs for surgical smoke safety change. So how can your team accomplish this? Well, we've provided this decision tool for surgical smoke evacuation that can assist you with that initial assessment and intraoperative assessment of surgical smoke evacuation and filtration needs based on the type of procedure and anticipated amount of surgical smoke. When surgical smoke is anticipated, all members of the surgical team should understand the plan for surgical smoke management and have the opportunity to provide input into that plan. AORN continues to recommend that facilities should evacuate and filter all surgical smoke. No surgical smoke is safe. Support for surgical smoke safety comes from many organizations, including the CDC, NIOSH, SAGES, AST, and ANSI. There is clear consensus among professional organizations, standard setting bodies, accreditation agencies, that surgical smoke is a hazard and should be managed through effective evacuation and filtration to provide a safe environment for peri perioperative staff members and for our patients. Speaking of patients, not only does surgical smoke bother staff members, but it has an effect on patient experience. Let's talk about two studies. First, there is a randomized controlled tr trial of 160 adult patients undergoing Mohs micrographic dermatologic surgery. It compared smoke evacuation to no smoke evacuation on patient experience. Patients were asked about their experience during surgery related to surgical smoke. And the researchers found that patients in the smoke evacuation group noticed that smell of surgical smoke significantly less than those in the control group. They were also significantly less bothered by the smell of surgical smoke. They concluded that the use of smoke evacuation may improve patient experience uh, for patients undergoing dermatologic procedures. Another study, this is a comparative pilot study, um, the researchers surveyed 36 patients about their perception of electrosurgery smoke. Also, patients who happen to be going undergoing Mohs surgery. And so they used, uh, they compared no smoke evacuation to smoke evacuation use. And when no smoke evacuation was used, all of the patients reported perceiving a burning odor. They also, also 66%, uh, about 66% of them reported that that odor was unpleasant. And this is compared to the period during closure when smoke removal was used when um, only 16% of patients reported an unpleasant odor. And so the researchers in this study concluded that smoke evacuation can create a more pleasant patient experience. And we know patient experience is very important. But let's also talk about smoke evacuation effectiveness. The researchers of a prospective randomized study sought to evaluate the effectiveness of surgical smoke evacuation during breast surgery. 
So they measured environmental conditions such as total volatile organic compound levels uh, and also formaldehyde levels. They measured this at two locations within the operating room, near the OR table and away from the OR table. Uh, they measured personnel exposure levels of various personnel in the room, including surgeons, surgical assistants, scrub nurses, circulating nurses, and anesthetists. This happened during breast surgical procedures. There were 30, about 30 patients in uh, each group. The analysis demonstrated that the use of surgical smoke evacuation had a significant effect on lowering total volatile organic compound levels and formaldehyde concentrations at both locations. Uh, the researchers also performed a multiple regression analysis that revealed that the surgical smoke evacuator was a factor that significantly impacted personal exposure to formaldehyde and acetylaldehyde for the entire team. The conclusion here was that surgical smoke evacuators are effective in reducing personal exposure to the hazards of surgical smoke. And in another quasi-experimental study, uh, researchers found that um, smoke evacuators are beneficial and they found that uh, surgical smoke evacuators can reduce surgical smoke by up to 99% when used under optimal conditions. Let's talk about the types of filters. An update was made to the uh, types of filters for surgical smoke evacuation and filtration. This states that to use a surgical smoke evacuator system that contains an ULPA filter with an activated carbon filter when surgical smoke is anticipated. So manufacturers design filters and with various components and combination filters do offer a variety of benefits. Pre-filter captures small amounts of liquid or tissue to protect the filter from debris or damage from moisture. Pre-filter uh, may be made from sponge or wire material and may include a container or fluid dropout of some sort. The OPA filter captures particles in surgical smoke with an overall particulate efficiency of not less than 99.99% at a tested most penetrating particle size. And typically for OPA filters, this is around 0.12 micrometers. The activated carbon filter adsorbs gases in the surgical smoke, such as with volatile organic compounds. It also removes some of the odors in surgical smoke. Some manufacturers may even include specialized filters that adsorb specific gases. And this recommendation not only applies to surgical smoke evacuation systems, uh, and laparoscopic systems, but also um, when using a medical surgical vacuum with an inline filter. We continue to recommend the use of surgical smoke management systems during minimally invasive procedures. A new recommendation includes options for surgical smoke evacuation equipment during MIS procedures such as trocars with built-in filters, tubing, or accessories with ULPA and activated carbon filtration. Activated carbon filters in laparoscopic surgical smoke evacuation equipment reduce the levels of volatile organic compounds released during surgery. And this is supported by the evidence, of course. Addition, an additional new recommendation related to minimally invasive surgical uh, invasive procedures includes uh, minimally invasive surgical smoke evacuation uh, and filtration um, should be used during minimally invasive procedures and that unfiltered surgical smoke should not be released into the operating room during minimally invasive procedures. Before the removal of trocars, the insufflation gas may be filtered using a mechanical desufflation or a passive filtration method. Filtering insufflation gas before removal of the trocars prevents possible perioperative team member exposure 
to surgical smoke contaminants. Let's move on to respiratory protection. This is a new section and we have um, always recommended respiratory protection for protection against um, residual surgical smoke. Uh, and a reminder that personal protective equipment used for respiratory protection should not be considered a replacement for effective surgical smoke evacuation and filtration. Also remember that a surgical mask is not considered respiratory protection. A uh, change in recommendation related to procedures on HPV containing tissue. Uh, this states wear respiratory protection such as a surgical N95 filtering face piece respirator in conjunction with surgical smoke evacuation and filtration when participating in procedures using smoke generating surgical devices on tissue containing HPV. This was previously a conditional recommendation and now is a recommendation based on the evidence. Another new conditional recommendation states that for open smoke generating procedures involving the liver, respiratory protection uh, may be worn in conjunction with smoke evacuation and filtration. So let's first talk about uh, the recent research regarding the viral presence uh, of HPV and infection prevent, uh, potential in surgical smoke. We have two uh, studies here. Uh, one is a uh, systematic review evaluating the risk of HPV transmission related to surgical smoke, uh, surgical smoke exposure. And they concluded that HPV DNA is detectable in surgical smoke from HPV tissue and therefore should be considered potentially infectious. And an additional study show that this is from Zoo and colleagues. Um, it was a study of 134 patients with HPV infections. Um, and the researchers detected HPV DNA in surgical smoke of 40, in 40 of the 134 procedures. And that the subtypes of the HPV DNA were consistent with the patient's cervical cell HPV subtype. They also detected HPV DNA in the nasal epithelial cells of two of the surgeons after loop electrosurgical excision procedures. And these surgeons were previously negative. The researchers in this study concluded that HPV DNA may be present in leap surgical smoke and is possibly infectious. At this time, no recommendation can be made regarding occupational HPV vaccination for personnel who participate in surgical smoke generating procedures involving tissue containing oncogenic HPV. No evidence exists as to whether a occupational HPV vaccination would provide protection for OR personnel who participate in smoke generating procedures involving tissue containing the oncogenic HPV subtypes. And additionally, the CDC currently does not provide HPV vaccination recommendations for healthcare workers, although clinical trials are underway. And further research is needed to determine the benefits and harms of HPV vaccination for healthcare workers. So let's also look at some of the recent research related to particulate matter. Remember that particulate matter is concerning because the smallest particles, the ultra-fine particles, can reach the very, uh, the tiniest structures in our lungs of the alveoli, the air exchange structures. High quality evidence suggests that the, tish, the type of tissue treated associates, uh, is associated with fine particle and ultra-fine particle concentrations and with personal exposure. Liver tissue was consistently found to produce the highest concentrations of total particles and ultra-fine particles. So moving on to our education section. The section here really did not change uh, significantly. We did update it with information related to the updated uh, recommendations. 
You can always reach the education products with a, for AORN every time a um, guideline is updated with the guideline essentials. That QR code will take you directly to the full uh, suite of guideline essentials. Policies and procedures section has not changed significantly, but what we did add was a rec recommendation uh, to include procedures for reporting injuries or failures with surgical smoke evacuation devices that potentially affect patient or staff safety. Um, the FDA provides information about medical device reporting. So you can go to fda.gov, that link there will take you to, to more information related to uh, device reporting. And in section six, our quality section, we continue to recommend that facilities identify barriers to implementing surgical smoke evacuation and filtration in the perioperative setting and to address them through interventions to improve smoke safety practices. Now, new evidence also suggests that there are barriers related to wearing the recommended PPE as secondary protection uh, against residual surgical smoke. So we also added a recommendation to include um, uh, identifying those barriers in your facility. Identifying a smoke-free program can assist your facility with implementing best practices surrounding surgical smoke safety. The mission of AORN is to promote safety for patients undergoing operative and invasive procedures. AORN also believes that all perioperative staff members should have a safe and healthy work environment. AORN has available the AORN Go Clear program. This is a surgical smoke-free recognition program and is free of cost. Um, it provides a comprehensive approach to assist facilities in becoming smoke-free. Visit AORN.org for more information on that. And uh, again, this is the suite of guideline essentials that I do want to highlight. They include relevant case studies, articles, key takeaways, templates for policies and procedures, FAQs and helpful videos. You can even download a presentation that you can um, uh, customize to fit your needs. And again, this is free to AORN members. And a quick um, discussion about advocacy, which is critical to becoming smoke free. Uh, it is another way that you can impact surgical smoke safety at your facility. You can visit AORN.org. I've also included the senior manager of AORN Government Affairs, Jennifer Pennock's email here. Um, you can reach out to her with questions about advocacy efforts in your state. Um, visit AORN.org again, the Government Affairs page for tips, um, tools that, on ways you can become an effective advocate for surgical smoke safety. So these are just a few of the activities that the AORN Government Affairs staff engages in to lay the groundwork for successful surgical smoke safety evacuation uh, legislation. So they help with research and evaluation of competing um, and supporting nursing uh, or other healthcare provider priorities. They identify supporters of the legislation or potential opponents of the legislation, and they can assist uh, uh, in creating and crafting appropriate language for bills. They research elected Senate and House, House Health Committee members to find those with healthcare backgrounds. They conduct stakeholder meetings. They make an outreach plan and um, build a coalition of supporters. And finally, they can facilitate a step-by-step -step process for legislative efforts that are necessary to progress uh, legislation in your state. 
And finally, as you may know, there are five states now with legislation in place for policies to safely manage surgical smoke. AORN is petitioning OSHA to assist with making surgery safe for all staff members and patients across the nation. So scan this QR code today if you haven't already and sign the petition. I want to challenge everyone to share this link with at least one friend or family member because they too can help uh, get this legislation passed. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I think we're ready for some questions. Thank you, Emily. Yes, we have got, we, we've received a few different really good questions through the chat. If you have any further questions, again, please continue to submit and we'll look to answer those in the webinar if unable to do so live. So actually right off of the heels of what you just discussed, Emily, uh, first question is, are you aware of any other states who are close to passing legislation above and beyond the five that you mentioned? That's a great question. And in fact, there are, it's, um, amazing how fast we're seeing progression throughout various states throughout the nation. There are several states that have um, some form of um, or in process of creating legislation. And I would have to defer to Jennifer Pennock. Um, or you can always go to AORN.org. It's constantly changing. Um, there, under the government affairs page, you can go to your state and find out exactly where your state is related to uh, smoke evacuation and other legislative efforts related to perioperative care. Great information. Thank you, Emily. We've got time for two more questions. Um, the next one is, can you talk to us about the difference, if there are any differences in, in how you would apply smoke evacuation in those smaller surgical case, cases, perhaps ambulatory surgery settings or you know, small office procedures? That is a great question. And you know, we, we receive that question a lot because um, surgical smoke is produced anywhere that surgical energy devices are applied to tissue. So it really should be evacuated and filtered wherever that occurs. That could apply to an ambulatory setting or like I said, an inpatient setting. Um, but what you can do is use that decision tool that we've created to determine how you might implement surgical smoke safety. You can start small. Um, every facility has medical surgical uh, suction. So start there. Place inline filters between the suction canister and the wall, uh, that ULPA with carbon filter. That's good for small amounts of surgical smoke. And then find out where you need to implement smoke evacuation devices. Every case is different and every work with your surgeons and find out what would work best for your area. That's a great question. Thank you, Emily. And I got to ask you the same question that we asked uh, Julie. Can't let you go before doing so because you guys work so hard and you put in so much effort into these guidelines. In all of that research, what would you say was your aha moment? I was thinking about this. <laughs> so throughout the literature search and preparation for updating this guideline, I have to admit that I just did not know um, uh, all of the hazardous chemicals and the damaging concentrations of ultrafine, ultrafine particles that are in surgical smoke. So you can always go to um, AORN.org and um, look for the evidence tables for each guideline. And for this guideline, it's already up on our website. You can take a look through all of the articles that we reviewed and included in this guideline and um, it lists all the conclusions. So it's also a great resource if you want to um, arm yourself with the evidence and give it to your surgeon. So um, I think that was my biggest aha moment, just realizing, wow, this is very hazardous to us. So we need to practice smoke safety. Thanks. Thank you again to Emily, our future PhD researcher. 
that was a very informative presentation. At this time, I would like to invite Mackenzie Lapback from the Stryker team to demonstrate technology aimed at reducing surgical smoke in your OR. Hi again. For those of you that may have tuned in a little later, my name is Mackenzie Latt, and I am a marketing associate with Stryker Surgical Technologies. We are going to continue to talk about our journey to zero harm, this time our journey to zero surgical smoke. Before I give you a few product demonstrations, another reminder, we are taking questions in the chat. So type those up, we'll answer them in real time or circle back to the ones that we missed. So our Stryker Surgical Smoke Evacuation Solutions actually starts with our Neptune. Most of you are already familiar with Neptune as a constantly closed fluid waste management system. What you may not know is it also is a smoke evacuation device. So it comes with an ALPA filter that's actually housed on the side of the Neptune. This ALPA filter meets AORN's filtration efficiency requirements in that it is 99.999% efficient at its most penetrating particle size. It also has that pre-filter, that ALPA filter, activated carbon filter, and post-filter that Emily talked about in her presentation. We try to make our smoke evacuation solutions as customizable as possible including in our Neptune. So our Neptune has adjustable suction power settings as well as two different smoke evacuation modes. It also has three port sizes for different size smoke evacuation tubing or other smoke evacuation devices. That leads us to our next solution, which is our Safe Air Pencil. So our Safe Air Pencil is a monopolar electric cautery device with integrated smoke evacuation. So it is the same size, shape, and weight as what you or your surgeon may be using today without smoke evacuation, but it has that added safety measure. So the surgical smoke is suctioned from the site through this su suction sleeve, through the pencil and the tubing, and then safely filtered in our ALPA filter. These are customizable as well. They have different sized electrodes, different shapes, different lengths, and also different lengths of suction sleeves. These are all to follow industry guidelines that you keep the source of suction within two inches of the surgical site. Our safe air pencils also come in a telescopic option, which extends that smoke inlet reach for up to five inches. I'm gonna give you a product demo of these now using our safe air compact. So our safe air compact is just that, a more compact smoke evacuation device. It also has an ALPA filter that meets ARN filtration efficiency requirements, has adjustable suction power settings, as well as three different suction modes. I'm actually gonna start with it off for our demonstration. So here, I'm gonna take our safe air pencil and just give a few cuts. You can see immediately the amount of smoke plume that is created. One day in the OR is equivalent to smoking 27 to 30 cigarettes. To prevent this, we're gonna turn on our smoke evacuator and notice the difference. The smoke plume is suctioned through that suction sleeve into our pencil, into the tubing, and safely into the ALPA filter. Moving on, we also have illuminated instruments with smoke evacuation capabilities. This is our photon blade. It is an advanced energy monopolar device compatible with any standard ESU, but it has that on-tip illumination and also on-tip smoke evacuation. Our lighted retractors also have this illumination. It remains thermally cool. The, con the retractors themselves are non-conductive and it has integrated smoke evacuation. To round out our portfolio, we do have a striker solution for minimally invasive and laparoscopic cases. Emily talked about how important it is to still have smoke evacuation in those instances, so we have our Pneumoclear. Our Pneumoclear is an integrated insufflator with heated, humidified, and high flow smoke tubing sets. These tubing sets come with ALPA filters that meet ARN filtration efficiency requirements. As you can see, our smoke evacuation portfolio is broad and comprehensive. We make it customizable so that we can best partner with you, your surgeons, and your facility to find the smoke evacuation solution that best fits your needs. 
We really are passionate about that journey to zero surgical smoke, and we are here to help in any way we can. I'm going to open up the floor for questions now. Thanks, Mackenzie. Again, we have time for uh, one question. So the, the question is that you mentioned different smoke settings on the Neptune and the Safe Air Compact. Could you please elaborate on that? Yeah, for sure. So our Neptune actually has two smoke evacuation settings. It has continuous mode, where it will continue to suction that smoke at whatever power level you set it at, as long as the smoke evacuation is on. But it also has auto mode. Auto mode can detect when smoke is in the air and will then turn on the smoke evacuation device. Our Safe Air Compact actually has three different modes. It has that continuous mode, it has that auto mode, but it also has the ability to use a foot pedal to control your smoke evacuation. Thank you, Mackenzie. Appreciate that demonstration on the multiple technologies uh, we have to help with surgical smoke. I must admit, even as a longtime OR nurse, that demonstration hits hard every single time. At this point, we'll take a, two, a short two minute break before our panel discussion that you don't wanna miss. Welcome back. And at this time, we're gonna to transition to our panel discussion. So to, to join our ARN guideline authors, uh, we're very proud to have two of our perioperative leaders and educators, Valerie Marsh and Tom Krause. Dr. Valerie Marsh is currently a clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. Dr. Marsh has spent the last nine years as a perioperative education specialist and nursing supervisor at the University of Michigan and has been teaching in different capacities for the last 30 years. Prior to her work in education, Dr. Marsh has held various roles in the periop environment. Dr. Mar Dr. Marsh is very involved in research for miscare in the operating room and a sense of belonging for newly hired nurses. She has had multiple pro poster presentations on various occasions for AORN, as well as produced publications on topics including retained surgical items. She recently published articles titled, Counts Aren't Always Correct, and, and Tap Into Technology to Prevent Retained Surgical Items, in the Outpatient Magazine in March of 2020 and 2021. Thomas Krauss, has worked in surgery for over 25 years as an operating room nurse with roles including operating room staff nurse, clinical specialty coordinator, and supervisor. Currently, he works as the network clinical nurse educator for two major hospitals in the Phoenix Scottsdale area, Honor Health, Thompson Peak, and Sonoran Crossing Medical Centers. Tom has led the surgery, surgery smoke-free initiative at both Honor Health facilities and his passion in teaching and educating, molding the minds of current and future perioperative and procedural team members. Tom and his colleagues are currently developing curriculum for Interventional Radiology Academy, and together with his colleagues have taught several successful perioper perioperative 101 RN academies. Lastly, he has traveled to Central America over a dozen times with fellow OR professionals on medical and surgical missions. Thank you especially for that, Tom. So as with the rest of our presentations, we will have a Q&A session at the end of our panelist session. So please feel free to type your answers in in that Q&A function as time goes through the panel. So Val and Tom, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you join us today, as well as, as Emily and Julie mm -hmm. staying with us. Uh, so really appreciate your guys' engagement with this. Start with you, Val. Why is the topic of pre preventing retained surgical items important to you? And secondarily, what has, what has kind of shaped that view in your mind? So part of my role as an education supervisor um, at the University of Michigan for nine years, and then before that I worked at St. Joe's Hospital in the operating room, and it was always really drilled in my head by my preceptors or mentors how important it is to do your counts correctly. But that becomes difficult with more technology and how busy the ORs are getting and how we have like um, beepers and cell phones and iPads and people coming in to the room. So that task has become more and more difficult. One of the things in my initiative um, at the University of Michigan, I was on a committee called the CAPS Committee. And what we did is we started to look at what do we do to initiate adjunct technology and that was in 2008. Wow. So it's been a while. 
Well, I can't wait to hear more about that journey. That's been quite, that's, that's, that's been quite some time. Well, thank you for that. And, and Tom, a similar question. So what, what experiences have you had as it pertains to surgical smoke uh, that have kind of shaped your view and, and, and led to the efforts that you've made around uh, mitigating that? Great question. It's probably a number of events that have happened over a period of years. And just a little demonstration we had a few minutes ago brings some of that back to light. Uh, the smell of bovi smoke is just something that you work in the operating room day in and day out and you just, you don't go home and you don't really get rid of it. It's always in your nasal nares and you just don't ever get rid of it. But in addition to that, I had several coworkers that I worked with uh, probably around that same time working in a surgery for a long day that came to me and said, listen, I gotta share something with you. Uh, I, I hope you can support it, but I, I was just diagnosed with leukemia. And that was very surprising to me because the people you work with in the operating room are like your family because you spend so much time with them. And it really hit home, like I, I wanted to do whatever I could to support her, but fortunately that person, um, her, her type of leukemia didn't need any additional treatment. It was something that her oncologist wanted to, to follow. And just a short time after that, another coworker that I worked with, she was diagnosed with leukemia. And that's when all, it all started to come, come together and thinking there, there's some correlation between, there, there has to be some correlation between surgical smoke and the coworkers that I'm working with developing leukemia. There has to be some correlation. And uh, unfortunately, the, the person I worked with, again, you work with them, they're just the sweetest people, caring, compassionate, dedicated to their profession, and they have something like this happen, and it really hits home. Uh, unfortunately for this, the second nurse that I worked with, she uh, went through chemo, went through radiation, and then a couple of years later, she developed breast cancer. Um, not saying it's related to the surgical smoke, but I'm sure it doesn't help. And then I had a third person who, in conversation across my work, um, developed leukemia. And she, uh, as well, went through uh, surgery with, uh, went through chemo treatment with chemotherapy. And more and more I thought about it, there's some similarities here that why is it that there, it's happening in the operating room for, uh, environment? Why? And is there something we could do as healthcare professionals that maybe we can eliminate this potential that this can happen to other people? Wow, that's very powerful. I mean, you know, this, this whole event is around risk factors and mitigating those risk factors for both patients and for, for our, you know, our employees. But wow, when you, when you have a personal story like that or stories, doesn't get much more impactful than that. Thank you for sharing that, Tom. Sure. So I want to go into a series of questions for each one of you. Um, but Val and Tom, you both led, led large-scale implementation efforts uh, at your facilities for adjunct technology and taking action against these hazards in your facilities. So, so Val, I want to start with you. Um, could you please share why you think it is important to advocate for adjunct technology to prevent RSIs and how you uh, some ways in how you help champion this safety initiative? So when I, so when I started as the perioperative education specialist supervisor, long name, but we started looking at retained counts and we looked at different um, hospitals that had the highest number of retained surgical items, finding ourselves on one of those lists. So that didn't feel good. So we thought, what is it we can do? So we started a group of people, surgeons, RNs, scrub techs, phys, you know, patient care techs, we included everybody, wow. and including my entire education team of about eight nurses, I believe. And what we started to look at is what's out there for us. So we settled on the surge account. We looked at a lot of different, we looked at the you know, radio frequency and, the, and the, all the different stuff and found that surge account, which was, I think, pretty new at the time, was the best product for us to use because we needed to not be on that higher list of retained surgical sponges. So we implemented this and, it, and it's still actually going on today. They have this committee that still meets once a month and wow. they review the policy and they do audit and they do feedback to make sure that everybody's following the policy and standard practice. But it wasn't easy. We needed surgeon champions. We needed people to say, we're gonna use this consistently. Um, our biggest probably barrier was actually the nurses because it added just one more thing for them to do. Yep. And they do so much already. So that was part of the education process to get everybody on board, so. 
Very, very good. So, um, speaking of, you know, you, you, you alluded to the fact that, um, you know, in addition to adjunct technology, I heard you mention policy and procedure. So while you're on that, can you elaborate on, you know, especially with that robust group coming together on a monthly basis, how those two are coupled together to maybe help with our audience members? So what we did is once we decided the technology we wanted to use, we wanted to put it into our policy, but we also knew, and everybody should be reviewing their policies pretty frequently, at least every three years. So we looked at our policy and it was extremely long, probably <laughs> 25 pages. Um, we got it down to about 14 pages, <laughs> still very long. It's always a long policy. Right. <laughs> So what we did is we got people's input. So we had people from, we have multiple ORs. We have four outpatient sites and three inpatient sites. And we also included labor and delivery. So we brought all these people together to say, how is it we can use this technology, incorporate it, but make it work and make it something that we don't stop doing. And in the research that I did with um, translation into practice is what it shows is if you don't audit and do immediate feedback, that policy or that standardization goes away. So once we did the implementation and the education, we constantly for I think almost two years did every three months going room to room to make sure people were following the policy, doing standard practice. And an example is, um, and I believe Stryker teaches this too, but it, it's scan, break, count. When you put a sponge on the field, a package, you scan it, you break it, you separate it you count it manually but at the same time we're scanning it and we have the little barcodes so we know what is in each one and so then what we have to do is make sure that people are doing that because if you put a bunch of sponges on the field and just go scan 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 it's not the right way to do it so you have to be constant and you have to have a standard practice that everybody does all the time amen well that sounds like great practice <laughs> and, and yes anybody that's been through policy making or revisions knows that like I said that the count policy by nature is going to be a long one and difficult to implement or uh, enforce right. so great stuff um, you did mention uh, about resistance um, you know that's interesting to hear the resistance you know from the nurses and I think we all can relate to that uh, to your point of all the different technologies and different distractions they're dealing with um, can you maybe elaborate on on how you guys got through that that uh, resistance with the nurses and, and even any other resistance that you had? So the resistance was probably from the older nurses because they're the ones who taught me you count everything and I don't make mistakes. You know, that <laughs> attitude is like, I'm not going to do anything wrong. But in reality, if you look at the literature, this the operating room, the mistakes that come up in litigation is because Somebody in the room, either the two RNs or the RN and scrub took, they, they said the count was correct, but human error shows that it wasn't correct. And so they end up in litigation. So we really tried to emphasize that to the older nurses, that, that you need a two-person count, but you also need to use this technology. That was somewhat helpful. Um, the other resistance we got just a little bit was from the surgeons because they said it adds time. We just have all this time we don't already have and now you're adding this and we just don't have the time. Yep. So we had to really do some research and do some um, you know, conversations about it doesn't add time because if I know at the end of the case that I have all of my counts and they're accounted for manually and with the surge account, I don't have to go back to the OR. I don't have to notice at the end, you know, after the patient leaves the room that my counts are incorrect. So you take care of all that before you actually leave the OR, knowing and being confident that your patient is safe and doesn't have a retained sponge. Amen. Yeah, that's interesting, right? I mean, it's data and research is power because mm -hmm. as Dr. Julie talks about, it actually saves time, right? But you can easily see how a surgeon uh, would, would think that it would add time. So it's good. Um, please, add? please, Julie. Thanks. Um, and that was that was great input, Valerie. Um, I there was some older studies that did talk about like a few barriers with staff initially, but um, the more recent of those two actually. Sh and so just to clarify, we're talking here about the the surge account system that uses the barcode technology, not the one that some of the audience members may have seen today, which is a different type of system, different technology, but. 
the, that surgical barcoding system, did, there was some that showed some barriers, but the, the, uh, the later studies actually showed that um, while there is a learning curve, and there's a learning curve for every type of technology you implement, you know, no matter what it is, that the learning curve is very short and it will save time. You know, if you, if you know, if you can have a count discrepancy and you can find that sponge immediately or the soft good immediately, you're going to save the, the, the studies show, the one study that looked at timing with this, um, t an older study, but it showed 13 minutes, right? 13 minutes is the average. Um, time to reconcile account discrepancy. Some are shorter, some are longer. But um, if you can save 13 minutes, 13 minutes times however much OR time is, is a pretty penny. And, and it saves you taking an x-ray, so there's cost for that. It saves you time calling for an x-ray to take an x-ray. Um, so there's a lot of cost savings there. And I thought, um, so to your point, like there's, there is usually a learning curve, but it usually is pretty short and it applies to any technology you put in. And if you saved account discrepancy time and you're reasonably assured that you got everything out that you're looking for for soft goods. Right. And, and we actually now have incorporated the surge account into their um, Periop 101 program mm -hmm. where they have to do a hands-on demo and they have to, we, it's pretty extensive. It's an all day class on mm -hmm. counting and the policy and using the surge account um, with all new hires and anybody else who comes in, no matter if they're new grad or what, mm -hmm. they have to go through this. And so the, the, you know, the knowledge gap has changed. People are really accepting it because it's taught to them right from the very beginning mm -hmm. through the Periop 101 course. Mm -hmm. so, That's great. Mm -hmm. If I may add, uh, I remember several years ago, I was doing the surgery and was a trauma patient bring back to the operating room and you know in the documentation there was rumor maybe three four five surgical sponges inside the abdomen and the protocol for where we worked at was before we left the operating room we'd take an x-ray to make sure there wasn't any retained sponges and it was something that um, as we were getting ready to close and started the count we weren't sure how many we had and followed the policy called x-ray hadn't come in but there was some resistance from the surgeon that that doesn't need to be done and if we would have had the technology that we have now, then that would have been one less battle we would have had to fight. So it goes to show you how we've come a long way right. with retained surgical sponges and hopefully the manual counting and the conjunction with the technology, it's a win-win for the patient. That, that's great. I, I couldn't agree more and I, I'm glad you brought up x-ray. There is some evidence to show that there was um, a, a study published by the Mayo Clinic that did um, universal x-raying if they entered abdominal cavity and um, it showed that there were some false false positives so um, there, they only there was 33 percent of uh, things it was only 66 percent accurate to say so uh, even with universal x-raying when you enter the cavity so that it's not foolproof to do um, universal x-raying um, and and so therefore while we still continue to recommend you know, taking an x-ray if you do think something is retained, especially, uh, but, you know, it might not catch everything, and that's why having an additional layer is really, is really critical. So but thank you, yeah, that so was agree. a great, yeah. So agree. That's great. Thanks. Hey. Well, I think you guys are starting to get to potentially one of the answers to my next question, which is, because, you know, unfortunately some of our uh, audience members still have not adopted, uh, we'll get to smoke more in detail, but, you know, either one of these technologies, so, I want, I want to ask the, each of you, what did it, you know, as perioperative leaders and influencers, what did it take uh, to, to take the discussion around cost, you know, to administration, to your leaders, to, to make sure that they knew, even though it may be an increased cost, it was still needed? I think for this retained surgical sponges, if I may say that I think all it takes is one sentinel event or one retained sponge from when the patient leaves the operating room till seven day, several days post-op, that that's enough to support the need for this technology. That, that's, that's what I can answer for that. Perfect. And unfortunately, it's not only a few days, it could be years that all of a sudden the patient has a bowel obstruction or has scar tissue and they're very painful and they go in and they open the person up and they found a, a Raytec that's in the patient still, and it doesn't look like a Raytac, but it still has the blue little, you know, tag in it. And so that's when you know that we didn't do our count right. We didn't keep our patients safe, however we thought we did. 
and, and that's why I really like the Surgicon. I think it's a great product. When we brought it into our institution, the sales reps were right there every day with me. They set up all the education with me. They stayed. They stayed for weeks to make sure everybody knew how to use it. And that reinforcement was huge. That's great. So. That's fantastic. I, I want to come back to that uh, as it pertains to both topics. Um, last question for, for you, Val, and again, Tom, please feel free to jump in. Um, you know, you, you've been on this journey, like you said, for quite a while. What impact would you say that this, you know, this implementation has had on patient safety? And, you know, is there any um, data that you can share, you know, from post-2008? So we have a running clock for each department that has the surge account. And it basically shows how many days since the last retained sponge. And it's on our website. Everybody can look at it. And last I looked at it, I believe one site was almost 800 days, which is about wow. two and a half, three, four years. Um, other sites, well, if you have any kind of retained sponge, you go to zero, so no one wants to go to zero, right? Because that doesn't look good. But anyway, and so how that's helped is that we make sure that all of our staff have to completely count out every sponge before they're allowed to leave the OR. Manually isn't count, I mean, that counts and that supports the adjunct technology, but if that sponge count doesn't say everything's out, they should not be leaving the OR. Another thing I wanted to throw in real quick was um, if you think about and you're really like if you guys are really resistant to getting some kind of technology, think about the surge account as like going to the grocery store and scanning out your food. So no one wanted to go to that line, right? At first it's, oh my God, I find a barcode, I have to scan it. I don't want to do that. Oh my gosh, I don't want to go to the long line anymore. I'm going to the barcode area. And that's exactly what search account is. It's scanning your item, it shows what you have, it shows a number, that's how much you're gonna pay. You stick it in your bag and you go. That's a great analogy. And, no, and that it's was just one of the ways. that easy. Yes, it is. And that was one of the ways I was gonna summarize your guys' previous statements, which is, um, that I would often do as well, is say that this is really the cost of doing business, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's the supermarket going from mm -hmm. the 20th century to the 21st century, so that was a great analogy, thank you. Tom, any, um, you know, as it relates specifically to RSIs, any um, implementation effects, positive effects that you guys, that you'd be willing to share? I'll be the first one to jump on the bandwagon that when they were introduced, the surge account was introduced at our facility, it was, okay, one more thing that we have to do. You know, we're doing electronic charting, we're calling the family, we're calling the recovery room, saying we're coming out with the patient, we got to answer the doctor's phone, the doctor's pager, and amongst other things. And I thought, oh no, one more thing we have to do. But the, the learning curve was there, granted, but the advantages after the fact are so well worth it. That's fantastic. So well worth it. That's fantastic, thank you. All right, with that, we'll, we'll um, transition um, a little bit over to, to Smoke, and we'll start with you on this, Tom. Um, kind of going back, could you, could you share why you felt it was so critically important uh, to advocate for this adjunct technology as it relates to surgical smoke safety? Sure. Uh, several, several things come to mind immediately, and as the demonstration with the Neptune was, was given earlier, we already had the technology in the operating room. We already had it in, in six of... Six, several of our rooms that we've already had. So we already had the, the, the capital equipment. And then the other part was, well, we have options for the suction cautery, but why aren't surgeons using it? So that, that took us to say, okay, what can we do to go from where we're at now to try to get all the surgeons on board? And it was a collaborative effort from administration to the surgical techs that worked in the operating room. And we, we did a little gap analysis as recommended by AORN and we identified areas, what we had, what we need, and what do we, what do we have to do to become smoke free. And as surgeons as they are, you know, they go by evidence, they go by what's the best practice. We did a little literature search that showed that there are harmful effects, harmful effects of surgical smoke. We presented that literature to them. And then of course, there were the other question was, what's the cost difference? And then we mentioned that as well. And, and it really, in, in the grand scheme of surgical cost, it's actually very minimal, very minimal. If you don't mind, um, because again, I know this comes up in you know virtually every hospital that we're, would be looking at this technology. To elaborate that on just you know just a tad, I mean, it, 
point point is taken that it is minimal in the whole cost but you know a lot of people a lot of administration looks at cost you know one to one right mm -hmm. it's 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 going to be obvious that a surgical uh, pencil that has a smoke evacuator is more expensive than a regular Bobie pencil. Um, any other words of wisdom as it relates to that cost piece that you would share with our audience? Um, the cost difference is really inconsequential. I mean, average cost of a Bovie pencil, depending on your general purchasing organization, is between five to six dollars, and then depending on what suction cartery device, it's right in the neighborhood of twenty-four to twenty-five dollars. So, like I said, in the grand scheme of hospital cost and in surgical supplies, it's really that's a good way to put it. Really minimal. Okay, thank you. And I might add too, related Please, to Emily. cost, take a look also at recruitment and retention because those numbers speak volumes. And by having smoke-free operating rooms, you're more likely to retain great staff that's and great. yeah, and recruit those nurses who expect surgical smoke evacuation. That's and great. That it's great. I, I like that. Just throw in too that my guess is most operating rooms have a Neptune, and that smoke evacuator is on the Neptune. You have the you have the machine. You just now need the cords. Right. And right. a little education. And so, how much more cost is there? Because most, like all the operating rooms where I'm at, we we have Neptunes in every room. Right. Right. Wow. So. Those all three of those points are so valuable. Right. Anecdote. Some hard information, you know, these are the ways that you can get through, you know, again, helping our audience members, if they haven't, get through to their stakeholders. And that may be administration, that may be their manager, that may be, you know, name the person, but that's very helpful. Um, Tom, can you uh, elaborate? You, you, you began to go into this, so I'd love to hear from you that you had, you know, you had gotten in front of the surgeons, right? Again, everybody out there knows that that would be the first, potentially, the first place to get an objection. Um, can you go into a little more depth into how you brought those? You mentioned bringing groups together. A little more depth into how you guys did that? Sure. The, the, probably one of the most, uh, I could say, things that I had in common with the surgeons to build some kind of rapport was that when you're working in the operating room for years, you build a sense of them knowing you and you knowing them and you get to say hi to them every day and you know you work with them long hours as I mentioned earlier and you just get to know them and one of the things you know, that was successful for us in introducing the surgical smoke rollout was hey doc can I talk to you I got a couple of minutes that I want to share something with you I think it would be great for everyone that's involved in the operating room can I share something with you we're going to be doing a trial would that's you be fantastic. interested in it that's fantastic and and that was you know, they hadn't had that option before, and they respected the idea that we were asking them for their input instead of saying, okay, this is what we're going to use. Right. And at that time, they respected that, that, that being asked, you know, you know we, we value simple. your opinion. And that was really uh, one of the, I think, key attributes to getting to where we needed to get. That's fantastic. I think that's great. Mutual respect is so important throughout every aspect of the operating room. So that's a great example. Thank you. Yeah. You know, speaking of, you know, mm -hmm. looking at you, Emily, one of the questions that came through our feed earlier when you were presenting was, you know, is there any formal partnership between an AORN and, and um, the American College of Surgeons? And um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, and please elaborate if you, if, you, if you feel comfortable doing so. But, you know, I know that when we've talked, it's been really getting to the level that Tom was getting to, right? Sure. It might need to be one by one. But that being said, is there any, you know, thing that you're willing to speak to in terms of how we would partner with that? First, to say that surgeons can be our greatest champion and they are colleagues in the operating room. Um, so I love the idea, yes, continuing to support mutual respect among our coworkers and whatnot. And that goes with anesthesia, surgical technology societies, surgeon societies. SAGES has made a statement related to surgical smoke safety, especially in light of COVID. So uh, the support is there. And I think continuing to build that support and to mutual respect um, is key to success for surgical smoke safety and for the use of other adjunct technology. So yeah, there are partners. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Val, on that note, um, you know, anything that you'd be willing to talk through and from a from your perspective for smoke? So before COVID, 
um, my director asked me to put together a team of people so we could do the go clear for AORN and implement that. And it, it was a big task to find <laughs> all these different people that would be in on it, including some surgeons and our medical director agreed. Um, so we put together this committee and we really made a lot of progress. I think one of the biggest thing was making sure that on our preference cards or whatever that you would call them, we made sure that the, the wand and the cautery with the um, smoke evacuations, the, the striker hand handheld device was on the preference cards so they didn't have to run and find it. So it's in the room and it's open and, and hopefully you opened it. Some, some of the nurses didn't because the surgeons didn't want it. But I would say at this point, we're probably close to 60% smoke-free in and out of 58 ORs. That's great. That's yeah. Great. Oh, that's great. Great job. And, and my big thing is with COVID, like we don't really know what smoke, what is in smoke. We know a lot of it, like you said, the formaldehyde, but who knew that the HPV virus was in there? I had a nurse 10 years ago telling me, this isn't right, this isn't right, we need to have protection and nobody paid attention to her and she was right you know and so where is that where you need to we need to do research on where's the covid where's the covid virus when it comes to smoke mm -hmm. and hopefully that will help OSHA support us more amen so and don't feel bad by the way because i you know i've talked to so many colleagues that had a similar story right to, that's yeah. what all this research is so good for. Well, as Emily was talking, her face was flashing in my right. mind. Right. <laughs> I was like, she was right. <laughs> so, now to that end, to that end, it's a good. So, Emily, um, we've talked about a lot, but what other resources, um, maybe that you haven't been able to mention today, would you recommend to our audience that are either at sixty percent, like Val, or zero percent, or anywhere in between? It's a great question. I think. Um, you know, one of the first things people ask me often, what is the first step? What's the first thing we should do? And I think education is a great first step just to arm your staff members and not only nurses, but surgical technologists, anesthesia providers, our surgeons, our PAs and other assistants arm them with the education, with the information, with the evidence. Uh, so that's a great first step. And that's all available to you on the AORN website. We do, we do that work so the evidence um, is clearly stated. Um, the, we mentioned the AORN Go Clear Award. That's a great program or any other smoke-free program to get you started. Um, and just talk with each other about it. Um, so find out what resources you need, see what what gaps exist, and um, fill those gaps with education, with knowledge, and um, find champions. I think those are great steps to take, um, and the resources are there. Hey, Warren, really, we, we try to do a, a thorough job for everyone, so we do the work so that yeah. you can make the work easier for our staff members, for our hospitals, um, to implement these best practices and translate to practice. Translation to practice is so important. Great question. I would like to say reviewing yeah. the, uh, mm -hmm. the new smoke, the surgical smoke guidelines, I must compliment you both on, on your identifying that the N95 or the mask is the least effective mm -hmm. tool against surgical smoke. And I, I, I mean, years ago, again, being in the operating room for so many years, that was the standard. You know, do you got your N95? Yeah, okay, you're good. Okay. And now data and evidence has showed that that's the least effective. And I thank you for pointing that out. Absolutely. It is important to um, incorporate the work of, I have to acknowledge the CDC and NIOSH on that one, uh, to provide that hierarchy of controls where PPE is the lowest um, level of control, like you said removing that surgical smoke from even having a chance to get into the air is important so um thank you for that and well, yeah everyone we do a great job all of my team <laughs> all of our team everyone at AORN. so thank you for that we couldn't do it without mm -hmm. i mean nurses yeah. in the or advocate there's so many nurses out there advocating for smoke legislation smoke safety in their own facility there i mean to the work that you have done is also thank crucially you. important. So we thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
would like to share one more thing and not create mass hysteria <laughs> that I was recently <laughs> made aware of in re reference to the leukemia uh, folks that I worked with that benzene, one of the byproducts of surgical smoke, mm -hmm. suppresses the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. So there's some correlation there between the surgical smoke, leukemia, and suppression of the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. And I think, and all, we were talking about this earlier, mm -hmm. that I really think that the folks that work in the operating room, all of them, from the surgeons, anesthesiologists, surgical technicians, nurses, and all that, the number of folks that have been exposed and, and have suffered harmful effects is grossly underreported, or uh, grossly unknown. Absolutely. Grossly Absolutely. unknown. Because we think, oh, this is, it's probably just my story. Mm -hmm. So being able to share those stories is critical, I think, to your point. Letting people know that you're not alone and that these things are happening. And research has demonstrated that perioperative nurses report twice the amount of respiratory illnesses as the general population. Um, so it's, it's, a real, it's a real issue. And, and now that you say that, I know two CRNAs that had leukemia. And so the thing is, is like, it's not just about the staff doing, this, doing the work, it's also about the CRNAs and the anesthesia people in the room because they're breathing that and so is the patient. If the patient isn't intubated, they're breathing that. Um, I feel like surgical smoke evacuation needs to be addressed sooner than rather than later because there is a lot of data that shows disease process, especially like you said, asthma. I didn't have asthma. I have asthma now. You know, so I'm, did I get it from there? I don't know, but I do know I have asthma. Right, so, and I used to do a lot of babies, a lot of cauterizing the tonsils, just breathe all that smoke. <laughs> We do 12 so why in a row. not do something? We have right. the technology available. We have the tools. Mm -hmm. We have the data. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have the data. Well, I think that's exactly what makes all of us passionate about yeah. it. All of our viewers today passionate about it. Energizes me being a part of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to be, you know, completely honest, because, you know, it's been alluded to multiple times today that you know, the nature of nurses and a lot of other medical professionals is caring for others, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the one spot where it's different, many, many different things that you can impact to, to take care of yourself mm -hmm. or take care of your colleagues. So mm -hmm. that was very impactful. Thank you all. So um, before we close for the day, um, I just want to ask, you know, and again, we've been kind of hitting on it, but, but Val and Tom, you know, have you been able to be a part of any of those efforts, kind of, you know, anything that you haven't been able to mention inside of your local facility and then anything else outside of your local facility as it pertains to smoke and, and, and legislation? And if so, can you elaborate? So before COVID, I was starting to work with like some nurses from Beaumont and Tony Curry, one of the striker reps, really passionate about um, smoke evacuation. And so he gave me a lot of contacts of people to talk to. So I started down that path, but honestly, since COVID hit, it's like, everything else went aside and now we're just trying to regroup. But I know that the, um, the committee that I started at U of M is, is now going again because I have access to all their documents and so I see that they're, they're again up and working on smoke evacuation. And part of the biggest barriers is the surgeons. Um, they, they don't want to use it because it blocks their view. And so they can't see the incision because they don't like the tubing. However, we trialed a lot of different handheld devices and striker is what they ended up with because we had brought in the striker and they said, we want a choice. So we gave them a choice and they still ended up with the striker one. So, you know, we didn't give them a choice and that was an error. We right. should have done right. that. that. So we have much. to include them in the whole process. Yep. It's we huge. Great. Tom, anything else that you've been able to be a part of related sure. to, to uh, either topic, I guess? Sure. Several years ago, um, Arizona has a really cool thing, day at the legislator for nurses. And it's usually in February. And, you know, I, I went on and actually with the, the Arizona Nurses Association and some other ARN um, folks that, that are passionate about doing the best for, for patient care. And I had an opportunity to meet with one of the legislators. and. I thought, well, what do I got to lose? Uh, when I did my literature search, I got uh, we ended up with 61 peer review articles, and I put them in a notebook. And when I met the the one legislator who would give us a few minutes of his time, 
he happened to be an emergency room doctor. And he remembered all too well when we started talking about surgical smoke, how he would, the smell that, that would be there when he was there, hour after hour, case after case, day after day, being that silent resident, if you will, holding the suction for that yeah. surgical smoke. And he graciously took my 61 peer review articles in a notebook I gave him. And it so happens to be that's when COVID hit shortly after. And so that, that kind of got put on the wayside. But um, just checking this week that uh, the momentum is starting to, to, to gain again for in the state of Arizona to become yep. pushing that envelope and going with the other five states that have already become surgical smoke free. And now it's, it's like the snowball going down the hill. It's starting to gain that momentum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think we're, we're on the right track and hopefully Arizona will be, be there hopefully real soon. That is fantastic. Well, everybody up here, you guys should all be so very proud of what you've been able to accomplish at your facilities in, in sharing these experiences with, with others that, um, you know, again, maybe in a different part of their journey. So thank you all very much for joining us uh, in the panel today. Anything that I left out, any, any parting words from anybody that you just have to tell the audience to make sure they know? If I may say, just be that patient advocate. Just, you know, the, when the patient's asleep, we're that patient advocate. Go that one step further or two steps further for retained surgical items and surgical smoke because the, the patients are asleep. They can't say, hey, you left a lap inside, I can feel it. Or, hey, I'm breathing this smoke in. Do something, help me out so I don't, you know, develop a chronic problem. Just be that patient advocate and, and stand your ground. Well said. And I wanted to close also with saying that, you know, it's true, we don't have to wait for legislation. It's true. Legislation is going to assist those facilities where smoke evacuation is not a priority, but you can start today. Right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well put. well put. Well, again, thank you all very much for joining us yeah, today. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, we want to thank the, the, the audience members as well for joining us. And again, knowing you all have busy OR schedules and making the time for us. I would like to um, give a tremendous thank you again to our speakers, Julie and Emily, Valerie and Tom, uh, for the fantastic uh, presentations. I would also like to thank Stryker for providing the unique venue for today's virtual event and, uh, and the funding as well again. To receive your continuing education credits, uh, please make sure to complete the course evaluation on your AORN My Learning page. Uh, with, additionally, within a week, uh, the recording should be available for today's event on that same page, so you'll be able to access uh, this recording uh, thereafter. With that, and from all of us here in the mobile experience, and from lovely Phoenix, Arizona, farewell. Thanks, Jake.